Dr. Kishore Kumar Pichamuthu is professor and the head of medical intensive care unit at Christian Medical College Velo. He belongs to the batch of 94 from CMC Velo and has completed his MD, MRCPs and his DM in critical care. He is a recipient of multiple awards as undergraduate and postgraduate student. including the Jacob Chandy medal for best clinical student the Jacob memorial medal for outstanding patient care during md general medicine he trained in critical care sonology in westmead hospital icu sydney and is involved in training faculty and students in bedside critical care sonology he is proficient in bedside procedures and is an incredible teacher thank you Hello everyone I'm uh, Kishore Pichamuthu uh, from Medical ICU and I'm going to be talking to you and giving you an overview of bedside point of care ultrasound which uh, we call focus uh, now the point of care ultrasound is uh, ultrasound that's performed at the bedside by clinicians not by radiologists or cardiologists most commonly it's done in intensive care units and emergency uh, departments but it's increasingly being used in the medical wards as well and OPDs Uh, now this point of care ultrasound we must remember uh, initially ultrasound was the forte of radiologists and cardiologists and this peripheralization of ultrasound uh, it was driven by two things one was uh, uh, the newer uses of ultrasound which was uh, which were niche uses uh, specific to various uh, specialties um, which were which these specialties were more comfortable doing rather than radiologists second was the evolution of the machine itself and uh, with with the, this peripheralization there's a lot of advantages because uh, it uh, really uh, makes uh, you know it, it the it faster to get ultrasounds done you don't have to wait for radiologists to come in and uh, you can train uh, everyone in the department so you don't you have to have specialized people only doing ultrasound but the problem with this peripheralization is that it crosses turf lines and sometimes causes some kind of discomfort to uh, people who traditionally owned ultrasound but really who owns ultrasound uh, is uh, and i think sonology is a better for this peripheralization as you will see in the coming slides there's so many uses that definitely radiologists and cardiologists couldn't have provided for us now this uh, decentralized ultrasound is definitely here to stay um now what i will uh, what some of the uh, things that we will go through is we look at the equipment the way it has changed that has made bedside ultrasound possible we'll look at who can use bedside ultrasound and uh, what can we use it for a very qu quick uh, overview of the lots of various indications for it and we'll focus a little bit on ergonomics and infection control towards the end now the equipment um the qualities of any ultrasound machine that can be that should be uh, uh, that uh, can be used at the bedside it needs to be obviously light and portable that you can actually take it to the bedside it needs to have a small footprint because there may not be tons of space around beds in crowded wards or opds it needs to be battery powered so that you you know each time it doesn't shut down when you move it from one place to another and it needs to boot up quickly uh, some of the bigger machines take a long time to boot up and this is uh, definitely not possible when you want to quickly screen in the emergency department or on rounds and of course it must be able to store these images so that you can show it to an expert or process the image uh, subsequently and analyze it um also because it's being moved around so much it needs to be tough uh, it can't be very delicate so with all these uh, um, uh, you know qualities uh, when they came into uh, you know in uh, into the market it made bedside ultrasound possible this was a machine that we started off with 15 years ago and things have evolved now and currently the machines that we that are available in the market are really small when we say handheld these are called ultra portables they are uh, just a probe that is connected to a small screen the size of a phone or a tablet device wired or wirelessly so this is this is the current state uh, of the art and uh, these ultra portables have have made bedside ultrasound even more uh, practical uh, because these machines are cheap and they are very easy to carry around they are truly pocket machines and uh, so these are really uh, things that have changed the game now in india these ultra portables were not available till covid came along and uh, when uh, the regulatory authorities realized the importance of having bedside ultrasound that would help uh, covid patients because the standard ultrasound and standard imaging was was not really Uh, possible and so now uh, it is legal to register ultra portables and so i think that in the years to come this is going to be a game changer uh, in bedside ultrasound now who can who can be trained to do this ultrasound who can use focus and uh, how much training is needed for this what is there some certification that's needed 
and what kind of uh, you know issues may come when you do it and you charge for it now let's look at all of that so who can use focus anybody and uh, studies have been done on students medical students technicians uh, doctors at all levels of experience and specialization and what we found is all of these people are trainable for focus for focus and so this training is a very focused training it's not a comprehensive extensive training you've trained the person to do the procedure uh, that will uh, that only in only one particular area that he is interested in and initially after training there needs to be some uh, period of supervised scans and the duration of training um, before they are considered competent depends on the skill set that you're trying to train various studies have shown some training programs as short as 10 minutes have been as effective um, and some of course some more complicated uh, uh, procedures may need longer training times but it's basically the bottom line is that with a very short training period almost anyone can be trained to answer key clinical questions as good as a specialized radiographer i'm sorry radiologist or a cardiologist okay so there is of course there is no standard certification for point of care or bedside ultrasound at the moment there needs to be but there is a lot of variation geographically and and within within countries itself so this is there is a need to standardize this certification i am i am not sure when that will happen now the, another barrier uh, to personnel using uh, um, bedside ultrasound is that uh, cardiologists and radiologists can't charge for ultrasound use because legally uh, only obstetricians cardiologists radiologists can do ultrasound which means that if you as a as an internal medicine consultant were to do an ultrasound and then charge for it and you would be bound to give a report an official report and then uh, that could raise questions about the legality of your ultrasound practice so there are some workarounds for this one is to not generate an official report remember that the ultrasound that you're doing is augmenting your clinical examination and so often what we do is that we put the ultrasound findings in along with the examination findings or in along with the progress notes and so that it doesn't become an official report that's handed over to the patient uh, second thing is that the charges that we charge for the ultrasound machine because we need to recover cost as an integrated charge as part of the monitoring um, uh, cost or part of the bed charge and not as a special uh, investigation these are workarounds that might help if you are facing such barriers when trying to implement bedside ultrasound um, uses of uh, ultrasound could be either diagnostic or therapeutic now you must remember that this is point of care ultrasound is very focused we are not trying to do an, an extensive comprehensive evaluation we are trying to answer specific clinical questions only so the main domains of this diagnostic uh, point of care ultrasound um a uh, uh, lung cardiac vascular neuro abdomen and musculoskeletal as well Uh, so we just look at some indications in each of these domains in lung now lung ultrasound has become uh, 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 more important and has come into limelight after covid but of course has existed for almost 15 years now and has been increasingly getting refined and i find that lung ultrasound is extremely useful uh, in a day to day uh, basis when i'm doing rounds because it gives me much more information about the state of the lung than clinical examination or chest x ray it's almost like doing a mini ct scan at the bedside for peripheral lesions so it's really very useful and uh, what i'm going to uh, do is i'm just going to show you a few videos that will highlight some of these uh, uh, indications so i'm not going to go into the details of how it's done but i'm just going to show you some images ultrasound for example uh, these are just images uh, this is what a normal lung ultrasound would look like and that white line that you're seeing that's actually the pleural surface and below that is is lung and you you're seeing also the horizontal lines that's actually normal appearance of uh, artifact appearance of the lung so this is this is normal lung and you can see it moving so well on the other hand this lung you can see is not really moving well at all and that tells you that there is reduced air entry uh, maybe an impending collapse of some sort an airway obstruction um here uh, you can see another uh, feature this this is normal lung it's it's moving well and there is horizontal lines whereas here you can see that the horizontal lines in some areas are replaced by vertical lines these vertical lines are called b lines and b lines are always pathological and they tell us that the lung is wet the lung could be wet because of a fluid overload or it could be because of inflammation 
uh, inflammation also results in a leakage of water and an increase in lung water. So these B lines, we see B lines, uh, it means that there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the lung. And it is possible to differentiate fluid overload from inflammation as well. In this case, for example, if one side of the lung was normal and the other side of the lung had B lines, we know that's not fluid overload. Fluid overload is not unilateral. We know there's an inflammatory process, maybe a pneumonitis, uh, maybe uh, an, uh, an, a pneumonia that hasn't yet reached a consolidation state. And um, it could be one of those. Um, uh, sometimes, however, these B lines could be bilateral. So you get, you saw these B lines here. And on the other side, you're seeing B lines that are much more dense. So it's, it's bilateral, but it's not homogeneous. It's one side is more than the other. And uh, this kind of appearance could be, a, if it's an acute process, could be either ARDS or a fluid overload. And there are various signs that help us differentiate a fluid overload from ARDS, something that you can't do on a CT, X-ray, or clinical sometimes. You can do that on, a, on the ultrasound. Um, if in a chronic uh, situation, this could be the appearance of an interstitial lung disease. Um, sometimes uh, in a, a pneumothorax is one indication where the bedside ultrasound uh, is extremely useful because it's quick, it's way more accurate than chest x-ray or clinical examination and you can intervene quickly. So uh, this is a video, this shows a normal uh, pattern of lung ultrasound. You can see here that the, you know, the lung, you can see the pleura is sliding well. Uh, so that obviously means that the lung is in contact uh, with the chest wall. On the other hand, on the other side, you can see that's the pleural line, but you see it's not moving at all, no movement at all. It's not reduced at all. So you see this kind of movement, this kind of absence of lung sliding uh, usually suggests pneumothorax in addition with some other signs. We can't really go into all the details, but that usually suggests that it could be a pneumothorax. And often in such a pneumothorax, if you were to look for it, you will find a point where the air and lung coexist side by side. As you can see here, uh, you can see that the, this part of, is not sliding at all. And from this end, the lung is sliding in with each breath. And this confirms the diagnosis of pneumothorax. So pneumothorax, the sensitivity of ultrasound for pneumothorax is 92% compared with CT, whereas X-ray has only a 52% sensitivity. And obviously you don't have to wait around and uh, for the uh, radiologist, the radiographer to come around. Um, in uh, uh, COVID, we found this very useful. We've had a lot of patients who are very sick, who are on a, a very stiff ventilation. There are very high incidence of uh, barotrauma. And these patients, uh, you know, by the time the radiographers come into the COVID area and, and do the uh, X-ray, it's that's a, there's a big delay. And ultrasound has been able to we've been able to use the ultrasound to quickly put in chest tubes or diagnose uh, pneumothorax, uh, put in chest tubes and save patients. Um, this is, of course, another common use for ultrasound to detect pleural effusion. And you can see the fluid looks black, very easy to make out. And you can see the lung that's floating uh, inside it. This is actually the CP angle. Um, and you can see the liver there and the diaphragm there as well. Um, um, sometimes when, the, uh, when there's a consolidation, you can, you can make that out with the ultrasound. Uh, consolidation, the lung looks solid like this. It looks like liver. And you can actually see this branched white pattern of air bronchogram within it. Okay. Um, uh, so sometimes when our consolidations are not seen on x-ray, you may be able to pick that up on an ultrasound. Now, not all patients with respiratory diseases have abnormalities on the, chair, on the lung ultrasound. So you could have a patient who's hypoxic with normal ultrasound. Uh, that could be a bronchospasm. It could be an upper airway obstruction or it could be a pulmonary embolism as well. Uh, other than the lung itself, uh, when we are doing a lung ultrasound, we also look at the diaphragm. Uh, in this uh, patient, you can see that the left hemidiaphragm is moving very well. The right hemidiaphragm is not. So something uh, that you can make a diagnosis very easily using ultrasound as well. Um, just going back. Okay, so putting all that together, you you know, if you, it's it's very simple uh, to diagnose all these conditions really quickly within the first within five minutes, you've got. Uh, a definite diagnosis on a patient with respiratory distress. Um, we can also look at various um, uh, things in the airway. We use ultrasound for guiding tracheostomies and trichothyroidotomies, for detecting esophageal intubation, for diagnosing epiglottitis, and for predicting post-extubation stridor as well. Uh, cardiac, that's a very well-established uh, utilization of uh, um, ultrasound at the bedside. Uh, when a patient is in shock, it is uh, very uh, valuable to do an echo to look for the cause of shock uh, as well as to see whether this patient will respond to fluid and whether it is safe to give fluid. Um, so I'll just show you a series of videos of what hypovolemia would look like. 
uh, very easy to diagnose. The IVC is flat. Uh, you can see the LV in cross section there is empty. You know, it, it, the walls are touching each other. Uh, the lung is normal, it's dry. Uh, whereas in a patient with heart failure and a cardiogenic shock, um, we would see an LV that is not contracting well, uh, very congested IVC and lungs that are wet. Um, we could uh, diagnose, uh, you know, pericardial effusions and tamponades. This is a this is a view of the heart where you can see the heart there, and you can see this black fluid all around the heart. Uh, a very easy to diagnose pericardial effusion. This patient, if this patient was in shock, um, then you could also look at the IVC. You can see that's congested as well. This is probably tamponade. A few more views of the of that same patient with a pericardial effusion, and uh, you can see that's the heart there with fluid all around, and you can see that that's the RV and the RA, both of which are collapsing, indicating a, a tamponade. Um, pulmonary embolism causing shock. Um, if the patients may be too sick to go down uh, to the CT room and have a CT scan, and uh, uh, you know you could quickly diagnose that with the, with echo. So this is the, the the video here on the right is a patient with pulmonary embolism. The one on the left is normal. So you can see the normal. This is the left atrium and left ventricle. They are larger than the right atrium and right ventricle. Whereas you can see that in a patient with pulmonary embolism, the RA and the RV are huge. And uh, you know the interatrial and interventricular septa are being pushed into the left side. Um, a very easy pattern to recognize. If you've seen this, uh, you know this is all. You just need to when you, next time you see it, you know it's it's probably an acute pulmonary embolism. Sometimes you may be lucky enough to see um, a thrombus still on its uh, you know on the way to the pulmonary artery. This is in the right atrium, so you can see a bit of thrombus that's floating around there. Um, um, Ultrasound is also very valuable in detecting whether a patient will respond to fluid when he's in shock. Uh, for this, we look at the IVC, we see how it varies with the respiration, um, and sometimes we do a passive leg raise and then see if the stroke volume goes up. The stroke volume can be easily measured by echocardiography as well. Um, and if a patient is volume responsive, it's useful to know if it is safe to fill this patient. And uh, the echo is useful to diagnose diastolic function and estimate an LA pressure. And also, as you saw earlier, to look at the lung and see if it is wet or dry so that you can make a judgment of whether it's safe to fill. Um, sometimes you may see more uh, exciting things. Uh, um, valvular pathologies, particularly mitral stenosis, very common. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you don't, uh, the patient may give you no history, but you can detect it at the bedside. And we've done that many times when we've been screening patients. So that's actually the mitral valve. And you can see that it's actually very stenosed. Uh, the opening is very tiny. There's actually a left atrial thrombus, like a ball that you can see in there. Um, they, all of these are, these are very simple views that take maybe 10, 15 minutes to learn. And uh, can be, you know, this, these patterns can be recognized very easily. Um, uh, uh, cardiac ultrasound is also very useful during uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, when we take a 10 second pause in CPR to get a view of the heart and uh, I, we can identify causes, particularly in pulseless electrical activity arrest to identify either massive hemorrhage and severe hypovolemia, massive myocardial infarction, a pulmonary embolism or a tamponade, it's very useful. Uh, it's also useful to, uh, to look for cardiac standstill before you stop the CPR. Uh, it's not necessary, but you could do that. And what we found very invaluable is, uh, uh, you know, diagnosing fine ventricular fibrillation when what when it when the rhythm on the monitor looks like an asystole, uh, where uh, in asystole this is a this is a video of a patient that it looked like an asystole uh, cardiac ultrasound. You can see that it's 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 not contracting, but it's not uh, um, completely still either. This is what we call quivering myocardium, and this tells you that it's actually VF, and this patient needs a shock. So something that uh, might make a, a big difference to a patient. Um, vascular ultrasound, um, very easy to diagnose deep DVT. Um, and this is a, 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 these are videos of femoral veins of a patient. And you can see that on, on one side, when I apply compression with a probe, that's a femoral vein there. It's getting compressed completely. Uh, this is the femoral vein on the other side. And as you can see, it's not compressing. Some a very simple sign to diagnose. Uh, uh, DVT. You can diagnose, you can even, um, di you know, pick up uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, neuro ultrasound, uh, that's uh, something uh, not very common 
uh, it's not very mainstream, but it's very useful in medical patients. Uh, we can uh, use the optic nerve sheath ultrasound. Look at, the, look at the diameter of the optic nerve sheath to see if a patient has a raised ICP. So when a patient has an altered sensorium and, you, uh, and you're still not yet got the CT done, uh, you can quickly screen and see if he has got a raised ICP. Patients, sometimes the ICU who, who uh, drop their GCS and we are not able to shift them for a CT. This is a good initial screening test. Um, we can use it to look for raised ICP before doing a lumbar puncture, for example. What does it look like? Um, yeah, this is uh, the ultrasound. That's actually a, the posterior part of the globe. Uh, that's the optic nerve. And uh, this is the sheath. And you can see it's kind of become rounded. You can see that uh, it, it's, it's supposed to look like this. Uh, with no CSF, uh, you know, no CSF spaces around. And you can see it starts bulging uh, when there is a raised ICP, uh, because as you know, the meninges continue uh, on the outer surface of the optic nerve. And so when the ICP goes up, CSF pressure goes up, the sheath distends, and it's very easy to uh, di you know, diagnose. Uh, you can also look for midline shift um, using the ultrasound probe uh, over the temporal bone, you can get an axial view of the brain and, and measure from both sides and look, look at midline shift. Um, some intracranial um, hemorrhages like this uh, extradural hemorrhage or uh, these intraparenchymal hemorrhages may be visible on ultrasound as well. Uh, you can't rule out intracranial hemorrhages with ultrasound, but sometimes when you do it, you may pick it up. Um, transcranial Doppler is very useful in uh, patients with raised ICP. Um, to try and uh, maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. Uh, we use it to guide that. Uh, also to detect vasospasm in subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's an established uh, utility. Um, however, in some patients who, who uh, we think are brain dead, but they're having some, um, uh, some uh, things, that some like uh, some dyselectrolytemia, or they're still having some sedation hanging around that does not allow us to um, you know, to diagnose that this patient has brain death. The ultrasound can be, can help us augment that uh, diagnosis by showing us that there is no flow in the intracerebral vessels. Uh, ultrasound can also be used to guide lumbar puncture in very obese patients or when there is a lot of edema. Um, in the abdomen, I think abdomen indications are very straightforward, but what can we as uh, in, uh, in medicine use it for? You can use it to look for ascites, um, with, you know, bubble floating in black fluid. You can look for distended bladder in case there's a drop in urine output is a catheter block. That's a very easy thing to look for. Hydronephrosis uh, in, um, in, uh, in patients who have got a renal failure or you're suspecting a, um, a urinary tract, uh, upper urinary tract infection. Uh, liver abscesses. Um, and sometimes you can, you can also make out pneumoperitoneum. Um, where the signs are similar to what I described in pneumothorax. Um, and uh, it, bowel obstruction, sometimes if it's not straightforward, you can use the ultrasound to make your diagnosis more solid as well. Um, we often have patients who have fever in the, in the wards and we are evaluating them. A quick bedside ultrasound can try and localize uh, where the, the source of the fever could be. And sometimes when we want to do a lymph node biopsy for someone with a PUO, an ultrasound could help us uh, locate the biggest nodes and where they are as well. Um, these are just pictures to show us how sinusitis looks, a very common diagnosis, but uh, uh, which you can make out very well with ultrasound. That's just the probe kept over the maxillary sinus, and uh, you can see it just looks like one, one white line with just nothing behind it. But if there is sinusitis, the sinus is filled with fluid, you can actually see the entire uh, shape of the maxillary sinus. It's a very simple thing. Um, vegetations, of course, I think you're all very familiar with what that looks like. Therapeutic uses, we use it to guide vascular axis, guide thoracocentesis and paracentesis. Uh, you can use it to actually place percutaneous nephrostomies at the bedside, drain collections, um, uh, even identifying and set a, a setting of fractures as well and removing of soft tissue foreign bodies. Maybe these two may be relevant in the emergency department. Uh, we also, in the ICU, use it for additional things like recruiting lungs, deciding on what position is best for a very hypoxic patient with the ideas, deciding whether to do bronchoscopy in patients who develop a collapse. So we've seen a vast uh, you know, um, variety of indications, but um, uh, we've seen that it's really useful in many situations. It answers specific questions. Uh, it's obviously very cost effective and it's quick and you can repeat it as many times as possible. The problem is that you need uh, someone who knows that skill to be there. So it's labor intensive and it takes time to do as well. So it's labor and time. And so that's the only thing that's against it. Um, 
using uh, um, ultrasound at the bedside, it's very important to make sure that you're uh, keeping an eye on infection control. So just a few words about that. Um, we must use personal protective equipment uh, when you're doing an ultrasound. And uh, it is uh, useful to, if it's possible, uh, it's useful to use uh, sterile sachets of gel uh, instead of using a common bottle that you share of gel between patients. Um, we should use a sterile sheath uh, um, when we're doing sterile procedures. And um, this is, these are what these sachets of gel look like. And that's the sterile sheath that we use to cover the probe so that you can use it for sterile procedures like, uh, you know, guided aspirations and, and uh, guided um, vascular access. Um, which side of the bed do you stand when you do ultrasounds of various sorts? The side which you're trying to um, sound. That means if you're doing an echo, you should stand on the left side of the patient and hold the probe uh, with your left hand. If you're looking for a right side of pluriffusion, you should be on the right side of the patient and hold the probe with your right hand. This is important so that you don't lean over the patient. This is like obviously an ergonomic and infection control hazard. Um, and uh, after using the ultrasound machine on any patient, remember to disinfect it, wipe off the gel. You can use a hand rub, which is usually there at every bedside, to, uh, to wipe down the uh, surface of the keyboard, knobs, and trackpad, and the cable and the probe last. But of course, you must do this uh, only after making sure it is actually safe for your ultrasound machine. So um, that, uh, I think, is a quick overview of bedside ultrasound, and uh, I hope you've been convinced uh, to use it extensively in your practice. Thank you.